So things haven't turned out as you hoped. Life took a turn. A bump. A darkened sky. And at times it may have seemed there was no hope. But here's the good news. Our God is the God of fresh starts. Our God is the God of new beginnings. Our God brings new mercies, new compassions, not just once a year, not just when things are bad, but every single morning. This season has been tough. And for many of us, things will never be the same. But we are here, breathing, maybe smiling, or crying, or shouting, or laughing. But we are here, feeling, maybe fighting, or cheering, or seeking, or grieving, but we are here living and we are not alone our God is here our God is with us and our God is the God of new creations Well, hello, good morning, happy Sunday, and welcome to Ferndale Free Methodist Church's online service. My name is Pastor Bryce, and I'm the youth pastor here, and it's my privilege to welcome you to online service today. If you guys are a first time guest, we are glad to see that you've logged into YouTube to watch us. And we'd love to welcome people from across the country. We know that not everyone who watches is from Ferndale in the Detroit area, so we're glad to have you here as well. We hope that you feel encouraged and welcomed as you come to church today, and we are again so glad that you joined us.
horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you it's a new My name is Sherry, and I'm part of our guest services team here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church. Whether you're joining us from near or far, it's an honor to have you worship with us today. If you're joining us for the very first time online today, I would just like to extend a nice warm welcome to you. We love our guests, and we're so grateful to have you worship with us. Here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church, we exist to connect, grow, and serve. And so that we can better serve you, um, we would love to have you fill out our digital connection card. You can inquire about any upcoming ministry opportunities, or you can fill out any prayer requests that you might have so that we can be praying for you. Also, if you've enjoyed our online service, I would like to extend an invite for you to come enjoy one of our uh, live services. Um, right now, we're doing our live services out on the front lawn of our church under a canopy, weather permitting. Um, you can bring your own chair. You can use one of our chairs. Um, you can wear a mask or not wear a mask, but we will be social distancing, and we'd love to have you join us on Sunday at 11 a.m. Church family, I would just like to give you a brief um, update on our um, Lighthouse South Oakland Shelter Ministry. Um, we have decided that we're going to prepare and deliver 100 dinners and 100 lunches and 100 snack bags three different times during the week. When you might ask, Sunday, um, August 30th, Wednesday, uh, September 2nd, and Thursday, September 3rd. I just want to say um, thank you so far um, for all your donations of, of food and your financial support. You guys have just been amazing. But what we need right now is we need bodies. Um, we need bodies to help us um, with dinner and lunch prep. Um, and that will take place between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. And um, we realize that's a long time and maybe you don't have that much time to give, but you know, you can show up for two hours. Um, we'd love to have you. We will split times with you. Um, and then there's also uh, meal deliveries. Um, the meal deliveries, the way that works is it's a non-contact meal delivery. Um, you'll show up at the church at four o'clock. 
We will uh, load all the prepared meals into the church van. You will drive out to Auburn Hills. Um, there's a big hotel out there where our church community is now being housed. And you will simply, um, as a group, go up to the doors and set the meal down at the door, give a courtesy knock, and then move on to the next door. We also still have some donations of food that we're still in need of. Um, so if you would like to be a part of this wonderful ministry and help serve our homeless community, um, you can uh, contact Steve Duller. Um, you can do that via text or phone call. Um, he prefers text if you don't mind. Um, and you can do that. And his number is 248 390 1879. Again, you can contact Steve Duller at 248-390-1879. Thank you guys so much and you have a beautiful and blessed day. Good morning. My name is Laura and I'm the children's pastor here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church and I do not actually get to be in person this morning at church so for those of you who are watching online who are watching this you get an online exclusive i have the honor and privilege this weekend of standing up with my friends emma and andy as they're getting married but one of the beauties of being online and the technology that we have is that i can um, bring this to you guys from anywhere so we can watch together as a body of believers from all over um, the world all over the United States wherever we are we can come together and worship God which I think is just such a cool um, aspect that we are given so our object lesson for today comes from this photograph that I found on the wall of our Airbnb and it's a fence post in water now how effective is a fence post in water like this not very effective not really keeping anything in not really keeping anything out what if sometimes we're like fence posts because what i think is we're a fence post and god designed us with specific purposes for our lives and i think right here this fence post is trying to determine its own purpose and guess what it's not doing a very good job so when we are trying to create that for ourselves we become ineffective we're not using our gifts and talents and purpose that God has given us to work to the best of our abilities. If this were on land and it were like keeping cows in a pen, it would do so much better, except for this giant hole right here. Pretend there's a bar right there. Um, <laughs> but because it's in the water, because it's falling apart like this, it's really not doing its job. It's not fulfilling its purpose because it's not doing what it's designed to do. And that's what happens when we as believers try to determine the will of God and try to do things that we're not designed to do. We're just really ineffective. But when we do listen to God and we do listen to what he wants us to do, we're so much more effective. We serve so much better of a purpose. So I encourage you this week to look for the ways in which you are trying to, you know, fulfill your own purpose and looking instead for ways that we can fulfill God's purpose. Well, today I want to talk to you guys about uh, actually two Bible stories kind of juxtaposing them, which is comparing them next to each other. I want to talk to you guys about the rich young man and Zacchaeus, which you can find both of those in Luke. You can find the rich young man in Luke 18 and Zacchaeus in Luke 19. All right. And so what's happening here is you've got two people who have a lot of money. You've got the rich young man, obviously in his name, rich and Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, which um, back in that day, tax collectors took money from people they were taxing, and a chief tax collector took money from the tax collectors. So you know he's got a lot of money. And these two people right here are used to show how God works. It's, it's incredible. So you've got the rich young man who comes up to Jesus and starts asking him, hey, how do I be saved? How do I have eternal life? And Jesus' first answer is, well, you gotta follow all these commandments. And the rich young man is like, yeah, like I, I do that. I follow all the commandments. And then Jesus throws him a curveball and says, all right, well then take all your stuff, sell it, and give that away. And the rich young man walks away sad. Whereas Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus climbs up a sycamore tree, as the song says, to find Jesus, to, to see him. And Zacchaeus and Jesus make eye contact. And Jesus is like, hey, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. We're gonna go, we're gonna go eat. And so 
they go and just in that process, Zacchaeus is like, Jesus, I'm going to give back, you know, all the stuff I took and more. And it shows, you know, you've got these, these two people who started off in similar but different spots. See, the, the rich young man followed the rules and was rich. And Zacchaeus didn't really follow the rules and was rich. But they almost, they almost kind of switch. You know, society would say, hey, the rich young man is the one who is a better person. But in, in Jesus' mind, like say, Zacchaeus is the one who's going, is going to heaven, not the rich young man. You know, right after the rich young man, Jesus says, um, how hard is it for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven and compares it to a camel going through the eye of a needle, which is impossible unless you've got a really big needle, which they didn't have back in that day. And so we're taught that it's not what we do. It's, it's who we are with Jesus. You know, it's, it's that faith. Luke has this key theme of, of faith in Jesus changes lives. And the rich young man didn't have faith in Jesus, didn't, didn't give up his stuff, and his life wasn't changed. Whereas Zacchaeus, you know, he was taking all this money from people, but he had an encounter with Jesus, and he put faith in Jesus, and his life changed dramatically. And so I just want us to think about that and say, hey, like, how is Jesus changing our life? How are we putting faith in Jesus and how is it changing our life? I think that's really key to look at just every day as a Christian, because, you know, there are times where we can just go through the motions and our life isn't changed. But there's also times where we really need Jesus and without him, like our life is so much worse off. So I want you guys to think about that. And I encourage you to just go through your day thinking about the rich young man and Zacchaeus and what they tell us about faith in Jesus. Let's pray for students and teachers as they head back to school. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for educators and students, people who spend their life learning and teaching others. God, I pray that as people start going back to school in this crazy, crazy time, that you be with each and every one of them. I pray that teachers are given wisdom and discernment and students are able to learn in such a new environment. God, I pray for the people who are just entering school, those kindergartners who have never had a school experience before in their life, and this is what they have to go to. I pray for the seniors in high school and seniors in college who this is, this is the end of a very defining era for them. God, I pray that you be with them and let them know that they are loved, even though their plans have gone out the window. God, thank you for each and every one of these people. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, everyone. My name is Scott Gentry. I'm the senior pastor here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church. 
And uh, boy, how grateful I am to Pastor Bryce, our youth pastor, for leading us in prayer for uh, with our students and school staff who are heading back to the school year, whatever that looks like. In person, virtual, so much uncertainty. We're praying for uh, for students and staff, and we're praying for parents. And it's so much to navigate. So I appreciate Bryce's leadership with this. Just ask you to continue to uh, to be in prayer for all the the students, the staff, and, and parents as we go into uh, this this 2020 school year with all of its uncertainties. As we continue in worship, we wanted to put this worship song in as a part of our service today because it really speaks of, of God's, this relentless love that God has for us, especially when we face times of uncertainty. It's a song by Corey Asbury called Reckless Love. Uh, we've sung this uh, many, many times here in our church, but if it's, if this is something that's new to you, you're just going to hear over and over about how God just relentlessly loves us, pursues us, and fights for us. There are some scripture verses that will be helpful for us as we prepare to sing the song. I just listed three of these. These are promises from God's word to us, uh, just reminds us of his love for us, and it will help us to be in a, a right mindset as we prepare to sing this song. The first comes from the New Testament letter of Ephesians, Ephesians 3:19. Paul's prayer for the believers then and for all of us was that we would know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge and that we would be filled up to all the fullness of God. In the Old Testament, there is a, a word that comes from the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 31, 3. And God spoke to the prophet Jeremiah and he said, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. And that same love that God had for the prophet Jeremiah and for the people of Israel in his day, God says, I have for you. And then one more in the New Testament letter of Romans. This comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. The apostle Paul wrote this, speaking about the love of God for us as demonstrated through Christ. He said, one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it's not just with words that God speaks about his love for us. He says, I demonstrated that with Christ's death on the cross. So let's sing this song, Reckless Love, and I hope you hear the heartbeat of God for you today and God's desire to uh, let you know his tremendous, tremendous passion and love for you. Couldn't 
Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up So a few weeks ago, we began the study in our time together here of a New Testament letter called 1 Thessalonians. Now, this was written by the Apostle Paul, who not only wrote the majority of our New Testament letters, what we have in the New Testament, he was the, the most prolific church planter in his day. So right after Jesus' death and resurrection, uh, Jesus commissioned Paul as an apostle to go spread the gospel literally all over the world. And that's what Paul had been faithful to do. He had gone to the city of Thessalonica, which still exists today. It's in northern Greece. That's why it gets, this book gets its name, the book of 1 Thessalonians. And you guessed it, he wrote more than one letter. So this is the first one. And in, when Paul writes this letter, here's what's happened. When he first established the church, uh, there were a number of people that responded very favorably to the gospel of Jesus. Some of those came out of a Jewish background, same, some came from a Greek background, but the church was established. And Paul and two of his companions, Silas and Timothy were there, and they began instructing these new believers in the Christian faith. Well, they were only there for about a month before really persecution broke out against Paul, Silas, and Timothy specifically, and then carried on over to these, these new Christians. And so Paul, Silas, and Timothy were forced to leave the city of, of Thessalonica. When Paul writes this letter, here's what's happened. It's been about a year and a half since that church was established. They just didn't have the communication channels or even the travel opportunities that we have today. And so Paul doesn't even know if that church even survived. He sends his companion, Timothy, back to the city of Thessalonica. Timothy visits the church there and comes back and brings a report. And it is an amazing report. Timothy says, Paul, not only has the church survived, they're actually thriving. They're doing really well. And so that's the occasion where Paul writes this letter. He writes to encourage them in their faith. He shares his desire to how he wants to come and visit with them, to continue to strengthen them in the faith. And that's what's going on. So we started this study just a couple of weeks back and started in the first chapter. And today we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're only going to look at a few verses, verses 13 through 16. Now, I'm going to read these now. I'll put the words up on the screen for us. And then we're going to unpack them. We're not going to be able to, to go through all the little nuances of this, but there are some things I think are really important for all of us today. So here's what the letter says. Verse 13, And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, 
became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. So here are a few observations just about this passage. And you probably picked them up from what I was reading. If you have your own Bible or if you're going to the Bible app today, you probably can see these things as well. The first thing is Paul says, I'm thanking God continually for you. And this picks up from the very first thing that he said in chapter one, when he heard the good news, I'm just thanking God, I'm thanking God, I'm thanking God. Now it is a reminder for all of us, especially for believers, followers of Jesus, the things that we are most grateful to God for. And in Paul's case, he said, I'm so thankful for those persons that I'd been teaching and mentoring and discipling that they got the message and that they were growing. He said, I'm just so thankful. So any one of you who are part of our FFMC church ministry family here, or if you're with another church that really invests in the lives of other people, one of the greatest joys we have is when we teach the truth of the gospel, when we are discipling people in the faith, they get it and they're living it. And we say, God, thank you for that. And that's what Paul is doing here. The other thing is that Paul writes that these believers from Thessalonica, that they had become imitators, imitators, he says specifically, of some of the other believers in his day from the churches in Judea. Now what he's speaking about specifically, and Paul references this here, is he says, you became imitators because when the outbreak of kind of persecution came against you, you suffered for your faith. And they did. There were people that began to speak against them and there were some specific things that they did to, uh, to bring some hardship against them. So Paul says, listen, they did that to other believers. Believers. They even did it to Jesus because there were people that eventually that came from the Jewish faith that eventually had Jesus put to death. So he speaks about all of those things that they have in common. Now, one thing I will mention in reference to this, if you have a translation that when you read this, that it says that uh, this persecution that came from the Jews and some have a comma there when it says who suffered from the Jews, comma. Well, I, I prefer not to have the comma there. And there are many translations that don't put the comma there. And here's the reason why. When we read something that says who suffered from the Jews, comma, it seems like that Paul is almost like this is an anti-Semitic kind of rant that he's going on here. That he's just saying this is just the Jews. But really what Paul is speaking about are the, the Jews who specifically went and persecuted Jesus, who specifically persecuted the prophets. Now, to be sure, those persons who are Jews who deny Jesus as Messiah, he speaks about them even coming down here just in this portion of the chapter. But Paul is, is not going on this anti-Semitic. Semitic uh, rant here. He, he came from Judaism. He himself was a Jew and he really uh, spoke highly of his Jewish heritage, but he is speaking specifically about those persons who had, were actively fighting against God's people, the prophets who were speak, actively fighting to have Jesus put to death. And then that's what he's speaking about here as well. Now he does speak about this wrath of God which is being heaped upon them. And, and this is for anyone who denies that Jesus is the Messiah. So if a person is a Jew, but, but in Paul's day, or even in today's uh, time period, if someone would say, I don't actively speak against Jesus, but if they deny he's Messiah, God says the same judgment is coming upon them. We really hear about this in John chapter three, verse 18. It follows probably the most famous verse in scripture, right? John three sixteen: for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But in verse 18, just two sentences later, here's what Jesus said. Whoever believes in Jesus, in him, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe in Jesus, or the Son of Man, the Son of God, he says, stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So Jesus speaks about those who, who deny belief in him as Savior Messiah. They're already condemned. Now, it doesn't mean that there's no hope for someone because that's the whole reason the gospel message is being preached. That's why God, why God sent uh, Paul to Thessalonica. That's why we're preaching today. For someone that says, I don't believe it, God says, ah, there's always hope that as you hear the truth that you will believe it. And that's what we're gonna see really played out in this, this portion of this letter. So in this, here's what we have that, that Paul says, I thank you, you heard the message, you really heard that God was speaking and you accepted it. 
Now, here's what I want you to think about for a moment. If you know anything about the Bible or biblical history, and even if you haven't studied the Bible, you know these things, that God spoke to people, like when we think particularly back in the Old Testament, some of you are familiar with the accounts of, of Scripture where God spoke with Abraham. And, you know, God told Abraham back in his day, I want you to take you and your family and your belongings. I want you to go to a place you don't even know where it is. Just follow me. Trust me. I'm going to make you into a great nation. And Abraham believed God. And then God said that, that counted to him as righteousness, as faith. Or maybe you are familiar like with the story of Noah, God giving instructions to Noah. Flood's going to come. I want you to build an ark. I want you and your family to go on there, take the animals. I'm going to save you because I'm going to destroy the world with a flood because it's become so corrupt. Or we've heard stories where God spoke to Moses and spoke to him to say, I want you to go and lead my people, uh, the Israelites, out from captivity and the Egyptians and so on. The reason why I say this is that we're all familiar with those accounts in Scripture where God spoke seemingly audibly to people in the Old Testament. And they had conversations and that the people responded to what God spoke. Now, God could have spoken to them where they literally heard an audible voice. It could have been somehow that he really kind of had a mental impression. I mean, it doesn't clearly say in every instance that God was speaking audibly, but a lot of these, it really does seem as though God was speaking, people were hearing and they were responding. So here's what I want you to, to put your mind in for a moment. Imagine that today, this very day, that God said, I'm going to speak with you. I'm going to have a conversation with you. It is beyond any doubt that I'm going to meet with you. And I'm going to talk with you. I'm going to tell you things specifically for you and for your life. So if you knew that, what kind of impact would that have on you? I mean, think about it for a moment. Would you say, okay, first of all, I'm going to believe it. I'm going to make certain that I set aside time. I'm not going to be interrupted. I mean, if God said, I'm going to speak to you today. So this is our church time. Let's say God said, I'm going to speak to you at noon. When church service is over at noon, would you, if that were the case, say, I'm going to make sure that that is uninterrupted time. Or would you say, well, God, I mean, noon sounds okay, but I might be eating lunch. I mean, no, right? We, if God said, I'm going to meet with you, we would say, I'm going to clear the schedule. I'm going to make certain that I have your, my full attention to you. Would you make sure that you went someplace where you wouldn't, wouldn't be distracted? I mean, would you tell people around you, I have to be alone. I have to, to have this, this place, this quiet place to meet with God. When, when God, let's say that God did show up and did speak with you, and he spoke some things very, very personally to you, do you think that that would have an impact on you? Do you think you would remember that conversation? If God said some words to you that really kind of affirmed you, he spoke encouragement to you, do you think that you would receive that into your heart? Do you think that you would believe it and that that would, would mean something to you, not just for that day, but for the days ahead? Do you think that if you met with God, he had a conversation with you and he spoke with you and he said, I want to give you some instructions that I want you to follow. Do you think you would remember them? Do you think that they would be important that you would say, yes, absolutely, I'm going to follow them. And if you needed God's help, you would say, I may need your help. But do you think that you would follow those instructions? If God met with you, had a personal conversation with you, and in the course of that conversation, if God said, there are some things in your life I would like for you to change. There are some things that you're doing that are not the best for you. And here's how I would like you to address them. Would you follow his instructions? Would you do those things? Well, the reason I kind of paint that scenario is because sometimes we say, well, does God still speak today? I mean, does he spill, still speak today like he did to Abraham, like he did to, to Noah, to Moses, to the, all the people of Scripture? Now, please understand this, that what we have recorded in Scripture covers about 4,000 years. And God speaking in, in those ways, those very clear, audible ways, but, but those ways of, of clear, absolute direction, that was more the rarity than the norm, but it doesn't mean that God wasn't speaking because the way that God has spoken throughout history and the way that he so often does today is in, in different ways than just us hearing him speak audibly. All right, I'm not saying that he doesn't speak audibly, but that is kind of a, the, the path that we want to understand how God communicates here. So, so let's say you had this encounter. Let's say that God spoke to you. And then let's say you went and you told some other people in your life, family members, friends, and they said, you're crazy. God did not speak to you. Would that change your understanding that God did speak, that God was giving direction to your heart? 
Or would you just say, no, you know, no matter what they said, I know what I know. I know that God spoke to me. And if they did raise questions or objections or say you're crazy for believing that, would it change your own convictions that, you, again, that you knew God had spoken and you knew what he was saying to your life? Well, I, I pose that scenario because I want us to take from what we're reading in this account, in this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, and to bring it to us today and for our application today. God still speaks today. With beyond a shadow of a doubt, God still speaks today. One of the scriptures that I love to refer to, this is in the New Testament as well, and it comes to us in the, the letter of 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Now, if you're new to the Bible, and when you hear about these letters in the New Testament, here's the good thing. Any of the, le any of the letters that begin with the letter T, what I'm talking about here is we have letters to Timothy. We have letters to the Thessalon Thessalonians. We have a letter to someone named Titus. All, there are five of those. They're, all five of those are grouped together, so they're easy to find. So if you're flipping through your Bible and you hit some T's, you're close to the, what you're looking for. And always look up in the table of contents if you don't know where to find something. Listen to what the scriptures say. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God himself tells us that the whole of Scripture, all of the Old Testament and the New Testament, he said, Understand, it's God-breathed. It, it has come from my very mouth. And the way that God inspired the scripture writers is that as they sat down to write, like in the, the case where Paul was writing to the church in Thessalonica, God would speak to those persons and say, this is what I want you to write. Their personalities were still in place. They would write the way that they would normally communicate. They didn't just become robots. But God would speak to their, to their heart and would inspire them, impress upon them the truth that he wanted communicated. And so that's what this promise that we have from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Back in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah wrote this. This comes from Isaiah 55, chapter 55, verse 11. God said, my word goes out from my mouth and it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So God said, even when he speaks, and particularly when he speaks through scripture, when he speaks through what we have recorded in the Bible, he says, it goes out from me, there's a purpose for it, and it will accomplish that purpose. And that includes what he wants to accomplish in our life. The main thought that I want us to take away from today, and we're going to get back into this portion of 1 Thessalonians in just a moment, is the Bible is God's word. So the, this, this written copy, this Bible that we have, and I know we have digital copies, but there's some value. I'm just going to say this. There's some value of just studying uh, uh, the written copy. Sometimes for me, it, it helps me to understand that people wrote this and recorded it, and it's been passed down. I use my digital Bible on my app, you know, my phone app on my computer all of the time. But sometimes that can almost come across as just this is information. And so there's sometimes value of just going back into this, this paper copy of the Bible. So that's one of the reasons why I like to study my Bible every day, just reading from the, the, the paper Bible. But God wants us to understand and remember, the Bible is my word. It's my word to you. I've inspired people to write it. And it's applicable for today, just as true and living today as it was when I first inspired those scripture writers. In the New Testament letter of 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we read this. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. What that's saying is through the Bible, God not only communicates everything we need to know to have a saving relationship with him, a personal relationship with him, 
God says the Bible contains everything we need to know about how to live life today, living life in a way that honors him and that uh, is directed by, according to his truth, his precepts, everything that God wants to be true in the life of those who, who know him and follow him. So it's God's word, it's been communicated, it's true, and it contains everything that we need to know for living life today. Now, so God speaks through his word, God speaks through his Holy Spirit. That's something we won't go into today, but God is alive and active and he's given us his spirit that helps us to understand what he's written. And God also speaks through circumstances, through events. What we're going through with this coronavirus, so often God will use these events to say, I, I am either behind this event, you know, there are some things that I have put in play that I, that I want to accomplish something in the life of sp specific people, uh, an individual, or, or even the world. Or God can say that there are events that are unfolding that no matter what the source of, of them, because they could even be, you know, wicked in their source, but God can say, I can even work through that to accomplish my good. And that's one of the reasons why we're looking at this letter of 1 Thessalonians right now. All that we're going through with the coronavirus and all that the impact that this is having on the world, God says, there are some things that I want you to take away as a follower of me and a follower of Jesus uh, in how you live your life and respond to this today. So let's go back to 1 Thessalonians and here's how this all comes together. When Paul said he was so thankful to these Christians and in this part that we were looking at in chapter two, here's the reason he said that he was so thankful. He said, one, you received the word of God. Now the word of God was what he spoke to them. He said, I'm telling you the truth about Jesus. I'm telling you the truth about who he is, what happened to him, that he died for your sins, that he rose again. I'm telling you the truth, this is God's truth. And he said, you received it. And then he said, you, you heard it from us. And the reason that's important is that right now, the truth that I'm telling you, it's, it's not because it's my words, it's, it's God's truth. So God wants you to hear and receive the truth that comes from the Bible as his truth. He said, you heard it from me, you heard it from my companions, from Silas and Timothy. And then he said, you accepted it as God's word. Now this is the big thing, right? This is the big point of today, why we're, we're having this message and why we're unfolding this in 1 Thessalonians chapter two. God wants to see how you understand the truth of the Bible, his word, and your response to it. In Paul's day, he said, you accepted it as my word. And then he said, and you believed it. And the proof of it, in their case, was they suffered for it. They, they not only said, we believe it and it has no impact. He said, even when it cost us something, we believed it and we were going to move forward with that. So. What God's question for us is, as you read scripture, even as we read this portion from 1 Thessalonians, do you perceive that as God's word? Or when you open your Bible and you study, if you read gospel accounts of the life of Jesus, you read in the Psalms, you read any place in the Old or New Testament, what is your response to that? Because your understanding of the Bible and your understanding that this is God's word and true, and it will be what will be the foundation of what, how you, you build your life on God's truth, that is everything. Because if you approach life by saying, I'm gonna decide what's right or wrong, what's true or false, then you have made yourself, you put yourself in the place of, of God really. But if we say, no, I don't understand what is ultimately right or wrong. I don't understand what is ultimately true or false. And I turn to God and say, God, I need your understanding on this. And when we look to scripture, when God has said, I've spoken about th this, and we base our faith on that, then we're acknowledging God. We're just what the believers did in Paul's day, that they heard it, they accepted it, they believed it, they built their, their life on this. So the question is, the true question is, how do you respond when you hear God speak? I'll just put it another way. How do you respond when you read the Bible? Do you hear when you read it? If God says, I want to, to speak to you about grace and mercy, do you hear his acceptance? Do you hear his mercy and forgiveness? Do you believe that he forgives you and that he'll forgive your sins? Do you hear him when he tells you that he wants you to live as a true witness, as a follower of Jesus? And because of that, he wants you to live in conformity to the teachings of Jesus? Do you live your life in obedience to that? Do you hear him when he says things like, I want you to set aside time to meet with me, to read my word? Uh, do you hear him when he says, I want you to submit 
to my lordship. And if I tell you there are some things that I want you to do to obey them, if I tell you there are some things I don't want you to do, that you don't do those things. Do you hear him when he speaks about specific things about your life and lifestyle? When he says some things like, I don't want to have coarse or filthy you know, language to come from your mouth. And he says, I want you to clean up your language. Do you hear and respond? Do you hear him when he says, I don't want to have you to have anything in your life that is really kind of have control of your life. And in that case, maybe there are some you know, substances you're taking uh, that he says, I don't want you to do things that, that will be harmful to you. And do you live in obedience to that? What I want you to get from today, from this portion where Paul was being so thankful to these Christians, and what I want you to hear from today is this, God speaks today. He speaks through his word. God speaks through the Bible. God speaks through his spirit to give you understanding of what you're reading. We go all the way back to verse 13 of the portion that we read today. Paul said, we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So I want to close out this time with a prayer. And the prayer is first of all going to be this. If you're saying, God, I need help. I need help in understanding the Bible that you would say, God, give me help as I read the Bible, that, that you would say, God, if, if you're speaking to me that you want to bring freedom into my life, help me to understand what that looks like and how to bring freedom into my life. If you're speaking to me that you're, you're just saying, you want me to know that I am yours, that the God, I would hear and accept that I am your child. If you're speaking to me that says, I know what you're going through today and I want to help you to endure, but I want you to endure hardship that you would say, God, I believe that, and I want to ask for your help to endure hardship. And maybe today you're just simply saying, God, I just need your help to believe that this is all true. It seems a little much. Maybe it could even seem overwhelming. It just seems like something that, that uh, is unreal. And God can say, understandably so, because the things I'm talking about are just so far beyond just common, ordinary life. I'm talking to you about spiritual things, deep things, eternal things, but I certainly will help you to believe. So I just want to pray for us as we close out our time, and then, then I'm going to give you some final instructions. So let's pray. Well, Lord, I just go back to the Apostle Paul as he shared the truth of the gospel with the people in Thessalonica of his day, and they heard it, they knew it was true, they accepted it, they believed it, and even to the point of putting their faith in action and suffering for their faith. And Paul just rejoicing, I'm just so glad to know that what you knew was true, you held on to as true. Lord, today, I'm just praying for all of us. I'm going to pray, first of all, for those who are believers, and not just those from our FFMC community here, but for people from all the churches and, you know, from across the state of Michigan and around the U.S. who are with us today. I pray that you would help every person who's a believer to say, God, help me to understand when I read your word, it is true. It is your word. And help me to, to live my life in submission to you and in submission to the truth that's contained in your word. Lord, forgive me for the times when I've read some things and said, I don't want to believe that because I just would rather go my own way. I have a different thought on this, but you're telling us my thoughts aren't your thoughts. My ways aren't your ways. And if we just confess the times that we have, have not lived in obedience to the truth of Scripture. And today we're saying, Lord, help us to always live in obedience and conformity to the truth of Scripture. Lord, I'm praying for those people that are saying, God, help me to understand what I'm reading because I read some things in the Bible and it can be confusing. I pray you would give them guidance about how to learn to read the Bible, to rely upon your spirit, and for you to instruct them to know what is true and then how it applies to their life. And I'm praying very specifically, Lord, for those persons who are right now saying, Lord, I just need your help to believe that this is all true. There's something in me that knows that it is true. And I'm saying, I want to stake my life on that. I, I want to trust Jesus as my Savior. I want to believe as a, as a Christian. But I just need your help to believe because so much of this I don't understand. And I pray right now you would speak and they would hear you speaking of the help you want to give. So, Lord, that's our deep prayers today. We pray in your name. Amen. 
So here's what I would like you to do in response to this, and then I'll, I'll be done. We'll wrap up our service for today. If you haven't already done so today, I would like you to set aside a few moments to get alone with God. Find a quiet place. I'd like you to take your Bible, and if at all possible, I'd like you to take a paper Bible. I'd like you to go and either turn to the Gospel of John that's in the New Testament. Now, there are, there's the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then there are some other letters written that are New Testament letters called 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. I'd like you to go to the Gospel of John. And I'd just like you to begin to read some of the first parts of the Gospel of John. And as you read, I'd just like you to say, God, speak to me. And at any time when God says, stop, that's enough, I just want you to understand what you've read and what I'm saying to you then just do that. The other thing you could do would be to take your Bible and open up to the book of Psalms. Now, if you open to the book of Psalms, generally what you do is you just kind of go right to the middle of the book of the Bible and you'll hit it. If not, you'll be fairly close by. Just to scan through the Psalms or the song book of the church, but, but God will sometimes direct us to, to some short Psalms where he can speak to your heart and you just say, God, speak and help me to know that you're speaking. Help me to hear what you're saying. But just take time today to meet with God, quiet place, say, God, speak to me. And then the last thing I would do is to say, take, if, if you have a, uh, just a notebook, some paper, a pencil, and just write down, here's what I sensed God speaking. Now, to make this be effective in your life, what you should do is to say, Lord, I'd like this to be my habit every day. Now, you have to decide when and where this works for you. But if you can find a time, a few moments, it doesn't have to be a long time, but before you get the hustle and bustle of the day, if that's possible, if it's at lunchtime, okay, if it's at the end of the day, okay. But a few moments where you just take time to say, God, I'm going to be alone with you. I'm going to read the Bible. That's important. And then you say, God, help me to respond to what I'm reading in the Bible. And if you can journal that, sometimes that's a good way of responding. That's a good way for you to begin to hear God speak and then to be able to act upon what he's saying. We're going to continue on with this study in 1 Thessalonians next week, and I encourage you to be back with us and, and study with us. So, hey, thank you for being with us today, for being a part of all that we shared today. I hope it's been encouraging to you. I'm going to pray that you have a wonderful rest of today on Sunday and that we'll uh, all look forward to being together again next week. God bless you. You have a great day. Bye-bye.